Hi, I'm Jean, and this is my game Polar Survivor, in which you are a polar bear on the last ever piece of ice, but everyone wants it, so you have to survive the ice thieving hordes. But this is a quick playthrough of the game. Here you are, always in the center of the screen. I immediately place some items you'll encounter throughout the game in your immediate vicinity. These blue things are scrap and flotsam, which you collect to level up, and this crate contains mystery power ups. I'll now collect this bit of scrap. And you'll now see, and you'll now level up and have randomized perks to choose from, which will make your character better in some way. For instance, uh, getting more projectiles or a dash ability. Uh, top center, you have the count up timer to show how long you've survived, and in top right, you have the ice timer, which counts down, and when it reaches zero, your ice would have melted and it's game over. I like dash ability, so let's choose that. The character has its own health bar. So you have to keep them out of harm's way too. You can see hordes of enemies uh, slowly descending on you. The game uses an auto shoot mechanic, which makes it a great candidate for one-handed play on mobile. And casual gamers also pick it up quite easily on other platforms. I've now broken a crate, and I have one power up, which is a heart. I haven't lost any health yet, so I'll leave the heart for later. Another thing I want to show is the debug menu. This is something I created early on to help me speed up my development. So I can quickly power up my character really quickly or I can disable projectiles, disable enemies and do all sorts of things. What you've just seen is, the, is an indicator telling you that a new crate has appeared on the other side of the screen. You can see the ice timer going a bit crazy now as it is warning you that you are running out of time. When I crack open this new crate, You'll notice a different power-up, which is a snowflake spell that adds 60 seconds to your ISIS lifetime. The research question at the start of this module was, how can a fun and commercially viable single-stick horde survival game convey a climate crisis message through emergence? Before I dig into the development journey, I just really want to get two exciting things out of the way, fast follow and super fans. I'll quote a passage I wrote in my research proposal. The original idea for the game was much larger and featured full base building and resource gathering mechanics. The pivot to a survivor game isn't completely out of the blue, though. Chris Zukowski writes about an untapped opportunity in the Steam marketplace, which is the high action, very fun arcade type game which can be sold for £2. And streamers will say, just buy this, and folks would skip the dreaded wish list because, well, the game is only £2. Can I make a game very cheaply that is a lot of fun, and can I convince enough influencers to play it? and get a bunch of players to just buy it." End quote. Chris Zukowski's blog post is from January 1st, 2022, which is just about when we started getting into this module and getting really busy. With the research proposal looming and me trying to get prototypes of the game out, I completely ignored Chris's blog for the next few months until recently. Boy, has the genre blown up. Chris has gone on to write many more posts about the phenomenon ignited by vampire survivors. Similar games start to launch as early as March, with one of them, called 20 Minutes Till Dawn, making half a million dollars in its first week. Nomad Survival, another one, made $100,000 in two months and counting. Chris identifies this phenomenon as the fast follow, carefully drawing a line between that and clones and ripoffs. It remains to be seen if the glut of survival lags continue, flooding the market and boring players, or if I still have a chance. There's always a future success to piggyback on, I suppose, unless I redefine the genre myself. It comes as quite a relief that folks actually like the game and the artwork. A fellow student said she'll buy the stickers, and another, another yet said she, she looks forward to a plushie. So that makes me think of merchandising opportunities in the future. Kids also dig it. My boss's 11-year-old son couldn't stop playing and feeding back. My kids also became my best playtesters at one point as I gained amazing insights into how shut off some mechanics are to them. For instance, crates contain goodies which help you. A seasoned gamer would immediately go for the crate once it pops up on the screen to see what it contains, but my little ones completely ignore the crates, and then wondered why they got game over when their health went low or their eyes melted. Regardless, whenever they came home from school, they always rushed over to my desk first thing, asking to play the polar bear game. I also found a super fan on Discord when I asked for feedback on some shaders I made. The encroaching flames you can see here. Not only did we have a long discussion on Discord, continuing to this day, uh, 
but they also sent me a Google Doc with observations and suggestions. So my next challenge is harnessing this relationship so it's mutually beneficial. Last but not least is my star player. They grew up during the Atari days and play predominantly N64 and GameCube games to this day. My game is quite arcadey, so my star player loved playing it actually, feeding back and in a way almost co-designing it. I got qualitative feedback to the highest degree from this player, which dealt a lot with game feel and responsiveness of the controls. I am very happy with the progress on this game, save for the bit where I missed out on getting to market earlier. Most of the elements of the game went through multiple iterations, with each iteration getting thorough playtime or eyeballs on it for feedback. As I had a good idea of what I wanted to make, thanks to the Vampire Survivors explosion, I jumped straight into development in week 1, while figuring out the persuasive elements of the game as I went along. I shared prototypes in person, on Twitter, on Discord, via surveys, and with my cohort via the university portal. The surveys were a mix of qualitative and quantitative questions. However, I didn't garner many responses for my surveys, so the quantitative surveys were meaningless. I'll try again once again, get some more players, and once I release a demo on Steam. I did get good qualitative feedback, especially from my fellow students and research supervisor, my superfan, and my star player. The feedback was always fed back into the dev cycle so I could demonstrate changes at the end of each iteration. In future, I'll keep in mind to leave the quantitative service until much later in the process, once there is some interest from the market. Some of my playtesters said that the bear character feels too slow, but this is by design. You're supposed to level up and collect perks to speed the character up. After some time playing, once the player has maxed out the bear's speed, it becomes a permanent buff that they can add to their bear's build. So trust me, with a faster bear the game feel is spot on, but you have to work for it first. I've also had positive comments about the game's audible feedback, which a fellow student remarked ties in with Jesse Shell's lens of feedback. I actually have the lenses app on my phone and it's an invaluable companion in my process. I focused on fun first and persuasion last. If you refer back to my research proposal, I outline where the talking heads refer to persuasive games as unfun nature, and persuasive games not having had their moment in the limelight yet. Finding the fun was a guiding light throughout this process, as it always ought to be during game development. Secondary research has already shown that this is a fun genre, and my own subsequent primary research with my fans and testers showed that I'm indeed making a fun game. Persuasion for me mostly revolved around getting the medium to be the message, or having the game be very on theme with regards to climate change. The single biggest game mechanic which illustrates this nicely is the ice timer. Our environment is getting hotter, so melting ice is the perfect outcome of that. This is also a unique addition to the survival-like genre, which only shows a timer counting up to see how long you can survive. The bear on the last ever sheet of ice idea also plays nicely into the climate message, and then the sea's colour changing from blue to brown also drives home that the ocean is getting more polluted, with the warm and red colours also being warmer. I work to my game whenever I have a spare moment. I set up continuous deployment very early on, so that the game gets published to each I.O. as soon as I push go to GitHub. On top of GitHub, I also use Dropbox as a secondary backup, as one can never be too safe. And here you can see I'm still using the project's working title as the folder name. I captured all my tasks in Trello. I have Trello on my phone, so I can capture ideas as I'm out and about. For art and art direction, I made a bunch of notes, even as far back as November 2021, when I had the original idea for a base building slash resource gathering game. Later on, I also captured the mood board in Miro. Or Miro. I made all art, but outsourced music and sound effects as I was out of time. I will, however, source more on theme music and Foley next month when development continues, perhaps by my own making. Getting better at shaders was one of my smart goals when I started this program. My original smart goal revolved too much around creating sh shaders for the sake of it, so I updated my goals to make it more specific to game development and making games look good. The bonus is that I reached this goal in mid-2022 instead of the end of the year. In addition to shaders, my smart goals also talk about becoming more fluent with the game engine, which in my case is Godot. I do most of the obvious stuff really quickly now and only ask the Discord infrequently. I'll be continuing development and uploading a demo to Steam as soon as possible, so I can start garnering feedback from the public, generating wishlist numbers and getting stream streamers to start playing it. I'm happy with the progress if I compare the game to what it was a few months ago. 
considering everything that's happened over the past few months, like getting COVID, being away from the summer holidays, buying a house, moving around a lot, and the nature of my work, I feel like I've managed my time quite well and made well-informed decisions based on evidence and the experience of those who came before, like Jesse Shell and Steve Swink and our research supervisor. The game does feel slightly pedestrian in its current state, and this is not really worthy of being labelled as a China medieval inspired, as the art direction fell a bit by the wayside in later weeks in a rush to get things done while the summer holidays are in full swing. I'll definitely feast this in the coming months before publishing. The fast follow idea I covered earlier made me realise that indies have to constantly keep their finger on the pulse to see what the market wants and where the zeitgeist is going. Perhaps market analysis is the holy grail of game dev. Thanks for listening, and hopefully I've shown how fun and commercially viable a single stick or survival game can convey a climate crisis message through emergence.